Welcome students. We're now in week five of our class and this week we're going to start our unit on poetry. So a, po a poem is a collection of spoken or written words that expresses ideas or emotions in a powerful, in a powerfully vivid and imaginative style. And so you may think that poems are just something that, you know, a, a lovesick a person would write to their, you know, loved one. But, you know, poems are everywhere. And uh, when, whenever we, as I said last, the end of last, uh, last week's lecture, whenever we turn on the radio to listen to a song, to listen to our favorite ballad or, or, or a dance beat, we're listening to poems. Poems that have been set to music, poems that have been set to melody. So many of the common aspects of a song is similar to and or a poem. And many poems were written to be sung. In Europe, when most of the people did not know how to read or write, so basically um, in order to celebrate heroes uh, in the culture, I think I mentioned this in a previous lecture too, people would sing about their favorite hero. In French literature, the Chanson de Roland, which means Roland's song, sings about the exploits of a medieval warrior who uh, bravely won his battle and courage. And so in order to remember who this person was, then um, somebody created a song. And also it's easier for the uh, singers, the minstrels, to remember something in song and rhyme than just a story. So singing was a way to, just like stories, engage people and help people remember and celebrate heroes. Poetry and song in also um, help people uh, remember us, people remember war heroes. And also poetry was a way, since poetry expresses such emotion in which you write in a few short words how you feel about something in a vivid, imaginative, what imaginative way, poetry through the centuries have been a great way for someone who's in love to express their love to their object of their love. And so love poetry is totally, uh, has been popular in Europe uh, and around the world for many centuries. From the sonnets of Shakespeare, I think we're going to go over a couple of sonnets of Shakespeare, to modern day love songs. So all the way from medieval times until now, poetry has been a great way for us to express our emotions of joy, emotions of grief, emotions of despair, and uh, any celebratory emotions, and then Poets would write their poems in a vivid style which captures the flavor of that emotion. And also in other cultures, um, poets would write about the beauty of nature and celebrate God's beauty. The beauty in, in other words, ja and Japanese uh, poets, for instance, would celebrate the uh, beauty of nature around them. And many haiku poems uh, are about the beauty of a flower, the beauty of a tree. Uh, the beauty of, of what the landscape around them. For me, whenever I look at a flower or a sunset, it's a reminder to me of God's creation and how God created this earth for us to enjoy nature, for us to commune with nature, for us to pray to Him in nature. And so therefore, um, that's why a lot of poetry to celebrate that beauty, many poets have also written about nature and the beauty of nature. So poems have been uh, written, have, writ have been written about all the same literary themes as the stories that I mentioned in week four. Love, revenge, anger. I remember when I was studying, um, studying French, French poetry, there was a poem where this guy was so in love with a woman named Laura, and she she couldn't she, she she didn't even know him from the you know she she didn't know him from Tom okay, but he worshipped her from afar, and so he wrote these beautiful poems in which her blue eyes 
were like the blue eyes of the sky, and the light of her soul like the light of the stars of the sky, and so on and so forth. She, he really was in love with her. Um, other poets, um, what well, we're going to discuss in a second. So let me go over the elements of poetry that we will be studying in uh, today's, in today's, in this week's lesson. So when we read a poem, we have to be aware of the poet, who's usually the speaker. He's the one narrating the, the story, or not the story. He is the one writing the poem. He's the one that's expressing his emotion to the reader. So you have two components. You have the speaker, who is the poet, and you have the uh, listener, who is usually the reader. And so here you have two components, the speaker, and that's why a poem is like a communication between the poet and the reader. Just like a story is a communication between the author and the reader. And so when we, when we uh, look at poetry, we are looking at the speaker. Who is the speaker? Who is the listener? And we're looking at the imagery that expresses the poem. And we're looking at how the, the poet uses Im imagery, sound, in order to create his masterpiece or his poem. And so, whereas when we were studying uh, stories, and when we were studying uh, literature, not the literature, when we were studying prose, which is another way of saying stories, we were studying plot, character, point of view, setting, theme, symbolism, and style. But in poetry, we are studying the speaker, the listener, imagery, sound, and sense. And then there are many different kinds of poems. You have something like a narrative poem, which tells a story. You have a lyrical poem, which rhymes. You have free verse poems. In other words, within the last, I guess, the second half of the 20th century, um, poets decided to experiment. Instead of always having poems that have uh, rhyming that goes A, B, B, A, or A, B, A, B, A, B, poets decided to experiment um, with poetry and to change the form of poetry um, to free verse. In other words, you could just write whatever, whatever, you, whatever you want and it doesn't have to rhyme. And other, and, and, and poets also experimented uh, because they went to um, China or Japan and they saw how other cultures wrote their poetry and so in France, people would try to write a poem in the shape of different objects, just like Chinese characters. And so this was very popular in the 20s and 30s in France to experiment with different kinds of, of, of stru poetic structures in order to come up with something very, very unique. So if you want to know the French, a French poet that comes off the top of my head, who did a lot of this kind of, of um, experimentation, Malarmé, that's M-A-L-L-A-R-M-E. He, he, he also, he did that. There, there are others, but Malarmé is the one that comes off the, oh, uh, Apollinaire, A-P-O-L-L-I-N-A-I-R-E. And also literature underwent uh, changes in form, and that became Le Théâtre de l'Absurde, the absurdist. We'll, we'll, we're going to cover that in drama, okay? I'll go over all of the changes in form when we cover drama. That's in week seven, I think. Anyway, so I'll, I'll let that one wait. So anyway, when we study poems, we're st we're, 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 we want to be aware of the listener, uh, the speaker, who is the speaker, and the listener, the speaker and the listener, and the imagery. And then so when you have... And like, like I just said, I know I just said this before, narrative poem tells a story. An epic poem talks about the chanson de Roland, in other words, the heroic exploits of a hero who won in battle. So usually it's some hero who won in a war. So that's an epic. A lyrical poem is song. That's the most common one that we associate with a song where we talk about our personal thoughts. So narrative poem, epic poem, lyric poem. But there's so many more different kinds of poems. Those, that's just the icing on the cake, just to get you thinking about you know, poetry. 
And so the, the speaker is usually the one speaking their innermost thoughts about how they feel, about uh, the person they're in love with, someone they're mad about, or they're like, like Alfred Prufrock. He's, he's so depressed about how everything is going against him. Or, so, so poetry, writing poetry, is a great way to release that, that spiritual energy. It's a great way to, because in a way, whenever we write, we are unloading our, whatever it is, emotions, and, and uploading it to the speaker, making us feel better. So this is why a lot of, a lot of poets, a lot of writers, feel a kind of catharsis after they write a book, an article, a poem, because they share a part of themselves to the world. And then it takes the burden off their chest. So that's part of the catharsis in writing anything, not just poetry. But poetry is something very personal. And unlike when I, when I was talking English 101, where you write a research paper in which you're just reporting on what other people have researched while analyzing all of and interpreting those reports to make it into a coherent essay, Okay, where you use third person case and you're not using your emotions. But poetry is the opposite, where you are exploring your inner self. You're exploring who you are. And when you read other people's poets, poems, you're getting a glimpse of, or a glimpse of other people's selves, of other people's souls. So with each poem you're reading, you are actually reading a part of someone else's soul. And what makes literature fascinating is that no matter when we lived, okay, whether we lived in uh, medieval times, ancient times, or now, if we read poetry or if we read literature, we can delve into the inner selves of people who are long dead, long gone. And then we learn about how, how it felt like to be a Roman soldier how it felt like to be a medieval woman, how it felt like to be a Chinese woman, or, or whatever it is that you're reading, how it felt like to live in Shakespeare's time. Okay, in French they call it Chaque Espère. I always love it when different languages have different uh, ways of saying the same thing. Um, so, we're, so who, so when we read the poem, who is speaking in the poem? In, and then the listener, is, it, is the listener you in particular, or is the listener the general reader? Is it someone that the poem poet is in love with? Because sometimes uh, poems are like love letters in which you, you, the lovesick lover is writing to Laura, for instance, that's the Laura, that's how you would say it in French and in Italian. Ah, uh, Petrac, now I remember the name of the poet. Petrac was writing to Laura. Petrarch, I don't know how to say that in English, but P-E-T-R-A-R-C-H, Petrarch and Laura. And this Petrarch was so in love with Laura, okay? Th those, those were the poems I was learning in, when I was studying French, uh, French poetry. And he wrote such lyrical, beautiful poems to Laura. I'll try to find them for you online so you can get an idea of what I mean. So, so basically the three elements, the speaker, the listener, imagery. When, so those are the elements we pay attention to when we read a poem, as opposed to a story where it's a chain of events that get more excited, uh, that gets more exciting, and then, then has, has a triggering event and then a resolution. But some, poet, some poems, especially epic poems, can be a story. But instead of everything not rhyming, uh, like in a story, it's the, uh, an entire story structure. In other words, it's an entire experience. Whereas in a poem, it, it has rhythm. It's like it can be put to music. You can, you can dance to it. So that's, that's another element of, of poetry that differs from prose. In prose, you sit, read, and you experience the adventures of your favorite hero, while in a poem, you feel what they feel, or you dance to the poem. And so most poems were written to be written into songs. And so a lot of times in medieval Europe, for instance, a lot of poets wrote their poems with the expectation that somebody would put it to, to a, somebody would, trans, would make it into a song. 
And so many uh, of the famous poems have been made into songs. So that's why uh, music and poetry are totally linked together. And so most people think poetry, and they think it's something abstract, but it's something every day. So, so as I, uh, let me repeat that. So a poem is a collection of spoken or written words that expresses ideas or emotions in a powerfully vivid and imaginative, imaginative way. And so in this class, we're going to go over some literary terms for you to know for this week. So denotation. Denotation is the literal meaning of a word with no emotions. So if I were to say a chair is something that you sit down on in order to get comfortable, that's a denotation. Glasses are worn so that I don't go blind, so that I could see you. No. Glasses are worn so that people are able to see. So that's, a, that's, an, that's an example of denotation. There's no extra layer of, of, of meaning to interpret. In other words, a chair is just a chair. So that's denotation. Connotation, that's the symbolism. That means the object has an extra meaning. There is an extra layer of meaning to that uh, object. And so that's known as connotation. It has a symbolic, the symbolic meaning of a word. So for example, if you were to say someone is a pig, then it has the extra implied meaning that that person eats too much or that person eats like, like the way a pig eats. So whenever you deal with symbolism, uh, metaphor, simile, you're dealing with connotation and connotative words. Imagery. So those are the images that the poet uses in order to paint the picture uh, for the reader of their emotion, of their situation. A figure of speech, that's a word or phrase used in a non-literal way to create an effect. In other words, um, symbolism. In other words, when I uh, add an extra, that's the same thing as connotative what I just said earlier. In, in other words, I add an extra layer of meaning, such as a pig, or such as the person is as big and round as a house. Um, and so when I add an extra layer of meaning to something, and that is a figure of speech. And then different literary terms that are figures of speech, and I've gone over this already, simile, which means when you use like, okay? John is so like his father. That's not exactly it. Okay. Oh, John eats like a horse. That's it. Okay. John eats like a horse. That's a simile. And then metaphor. Uh, and I did this last time. Uh, Juliet is the sun. Whereas a simile would be Juliet is like the sun. Yeah, that's the difference between the two. One, in simile, you use the word like. And in metaphor, you don't use the word like. Personification. Okay, personification is when you give objects human characteristics. So uh, Carl, I think it's Carl Sandsberg, uh, off the top of my head, and he wrote a poem where he said, the fog sits over the city. Now, so he gives the fog the human characteristics of sitting on top of the city. So that's an example of personification. Um, and then hyperbole. Hyperbole just means that you exaggerate something. And so if I were to say that um, this story is the best story the whole world has ever seen, that's, that's an, exa in other words, an exaggeration, is a hyperbole. When you exaggerate something, when you exaggerate a certain trait, and, it, and that's very common in story writing, and also in poetry, is that you exaggerate a certain trait of that character in order to make that character stand out either in a poem or in a story. And I remember reading um, Jane Austen, I think it was Pride and Prejudice, and there was a character in that um, novel, and her name was Elizabeth. And the one trait that, that uh, Jane Austen wanted to uh, make her stand out, selfishness, because she, Elizabeth only thought about herself. And so there was, in the book, there's a, there's a party. Everyone's at a party, 
And then um, everyone's talking about Elizabeth behind her back, saying how selfish she is. She's only interested in herself. And then in that scene, just as everybody's talking about Elizabeth, Elizabeth enters the room. And because no one wants to be caught talking about her, dead silence. They all look at her. And everyone's thinking the same thought. What a selfish, you know, what person. I'm not going to say the word, the B word, but um, what a selfish person that is. And that when she enters the room, you know, that's all everybody can think of. So, so when we use a hyperbole, we exaggerate one trait of that character, whether it's a character in a narrative poem or a character, oh, in the Chanson de Roland, Roland, we, uh, I'm sure the real Roland was a complex character, in other words, a round, a dynamic character, as we all are. Remember when I talked about characterization? Anyway, and there are different kinds of characters. So in real life, everybody is complex. But in a story, we, can, we just focus on that one aspect. Like in Petrarch, he focuses on the beauty of her blue eyes. You know? And I'm sure Laura was much more than just the beauty of her blue eyes. So that's a hyperbole. And irony means that something happens that's, that, that's unexpected to you, that's, that's ironic. I can't think of something off the top of my head that's, that's ironic, but it's usually something that goes against your expectations. You expect something to go a certain way, and then something else happens instead. I will have to research to give a better example of what that is. But that can be used in um, poetry. Alliteration. Alliteration is when you use um, uh, Peter Piper picked a peck of peppers, uh, something like that. P, P, P. In other words, you use the same sound over and over again in order to create a certain, um, a certain effect. So these are all figures of speech used by, in other words, simile, metaphor, personification, hyperbole, and alliteration are all literary figures of speech used by poets to help paint a picture to the reader of what the poem poet is trying to communicate of his emotions to the reader. Let's see. And then what else did I write? Oh, so and then and then you, get, you need to know the, the ex explicatory uh, essay. An explicatory essay explains the work of, or item of a literature. The purpose of an explicatory essay is to discuss the text and its structure. In other words, in, in French it's known as explication de texte. In other words, you analyze the poem, you give the, your interpretation of the poem in essay format. So you could say that um, poem X discusses the love and trials and tribulations of um, such and such a poem as he, discuss, as he discusses his grief over the death of his fiance or something like that. So you, you know, you're, you're, you're um, and also when you do an explica, uh, I have to say in English, explicatory, there you go, explicatory, because you know, I learned all of these, all of my literatures, I was a French major. I majored in French literature, which is why everything I keep saying is Jacques Espierre, and Odysseus, which is, which is Odyssey, and Shakespeare. I learned everything in French. Um, so that was my major when I studied literature. So you got to forgive my French. But, um, and so when I learned explicatory essay, I learned it as explication de texte, which just translates into uh, literary analysis, and you analyze the piece of literature based on your life experiences. And everybody has a different life experience. And that goes for poetry, too. So, so when you do a po an analysis of a poem, and then you write that in essay format, that's known as an uh, explicatory essay. I'm going to have to stop this. I'm just going to let it ring. A haiku. A haiku is a Japanese, is a Japanese form of poetry. So uh, when we have haiku, as I mentioned, a haiku is uh, Japanese poetry, and in Japanese poetry it's really, really short. It's just three lines. Uh, you write five syllables, three syllables, oh, five syllables uh, of one line, 
seven syllables of another line, and then five syllables of another line. So five, seven, five. And so you also got to think about that Japanese in, in, in or most Asian languages are um, very, very short. Each character is an image. And so that's why uh, it's it, the poems in Asian languages are very, very short since each character is a picture, is a pictorial picture. And that's why a lot of po poets in the early 20th century loved to play with the idea of writing their poems in, ch in the form of a Chinese character. And so that was, that was very hot in the 1920s and 30s. And so here is an example of a haiku. Uh, and it's by, uh, it's, it's translated by Sid Corman, and uh, it's by a Japanese poet by named Issa. So only one guy and only one fly trying to make the guest room do. In other words, both the fly and the guy are both sharing the same room and trying to uh, make, 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 the, make the best out of their guest room. And so in Japanese, that's a complete story. That's, that's another thing is the cultural differences in, that's why the cultural differences in language and culture also affects the poem's uh, structure and content. Um, in Asian poems, we don't, like, we don't reflect so much about ourself and our, about love. And, no, we do, but a lot of a poetry in Asian, poet, in Asian poetry is um, celebrating nature, is describing how beautiful the flower is. And so it's through describing the flower that you discuss your love. You're in love with someone. By, and you use the flower as a kind of metaphor or allegory. And so in Asian poetry, it's even more abstract than Western poetry. But, um, so, and it's also shorter. So only one guy and only one fly trying to make the guest room do. That's an example of a haiku because only one guy and, that's seven syllables, and then only one guy trying to, oh sorry, that's five syllables, only one guy and, that's five syllables, and only one fly trying to, seven syllables, and make the guest room do, five syllables. Five, seven, five. That is the format of a haiku. And I remember when I was teaching elementary school students, we loved haikus because then students could then create their own haikus, five, seven, five. And at the same time, the students learn how to count their syllables and they increase their reading. And so having your elementary school students write haiku poetry is a very common and popular activity among elementary school teachers teaching language arts. So if you go to, say, a Bitmoji craze for educators, and you'll see a lot of Bitmoji. A Bitmoji is um, those graphic uh, pictures that look like me in, that I put into my announcements. That's where I got the idea of Bitmojis. Yeah. So um, then a lot of teachers would share their haiku poetry. Well, they share a lot of other things besides just haiku poetry. Um, so, so you have poems, poems from other countries that are very, very short, especially Asian uh, poems, poems. And so um, some of the topics that haiku poetry talks about are, as they describe, usually describe nature, they describe gardens, landscapes, flowers, the moon, the snow, the rain, the plants, birds, forest, animals, fruit. So those are the, some of the things that a um, haiku uh, poem would be about. And so we will go over poems from diverse authors such as Langston Hughes who wrote during the Harlem Renaissance. And I remember I think that my favorite poem by Langston Hughes is I Too Am America. And um, I'm going to paraphrase it. Uh, I uh, come in through the back door. I am the one who prepares your dinners. I am the one who uh, cleans your floors. I come through the back door. 
I too am America and someday I too will come through the front door something like that and obviously he's referring to the second that's just a paraphrase from off the top of my head but that's just a, 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 I, he keeps an idea of what it's like to feel like a second-class citizen as an African-American then I remember when I was teaching my Asian American literature class I changed Langston Hughes's um, poem slightly I said I too am America I come through the front Chinese restaurant door. I serve you your I serve you the orange chicken. I serve you the tofu dinner. I come through the back kitchen door. I cook and do the laundry for you. I um, you know serve the customer their food. But I too am America and someday I will come through the front restaurant door or something like that. I was referring to how um, in apartheid in South Africa uh, there was a time during apartheid where my uncle told this story <coughs> where as a Chinese person he was not allowed to come through the front door of the restaurant and as a Chinese person he had to come through the back door. If you're if only white people were allowed to come through the front door and everybody else had to come through the back door. And so I kind of made the, I, I, tr I modified uh, Langston Hughes's uh, poem and applied that to Asian, the Asian American experience of being also a second class citizen. And so in my poetry classes when I was teaching uh, other literature classes, I used to have my students write poetry their own poems based on their experiences and modify their favorite poem, that sort of thing. I don't think you're doing, in this class, you're not going to be modifying poems. You're just going to be analyzing uh, the poets, uh, the poems that you are assigned. So uh, anyway, um, so that's why I love Langston Hughes, because his poems are so universal. And then uh, Dorothy Parker, godmother, she talks, uh, Dorothy M Parker was a rich heiress who was active in 1960s uh, civil rights. And Dorothy Parker, when she died, she gave her entire estate to Martin Luther King, to someone she didn't even know, because she truly believed in civil rights. And so uh, Dorothy Parker writes about, but she doesn't write about civil rights, she, just, she writes about her godmother and how much she loved her godmother. And then you have, um, and then we'll study other classic poets, such as The Last Duchess by Robert Downing, A Poison Tree by William Blake. And in uh, The Last Duchess by Robert Browning, that Robert Browning portrays, in, in the poem, this, you have a speaker, just like all the other poems, you have a speaker and the listener. And the speaker is talking to the father of the daughter that he wants to marry. And so then he talks about his last wife. And so in the poem, The Last Duchess, um, the Robert Browning character, he, he turns open a, a curtain and there is a portrait of his wife. His wife had passed away and he talks about her like she's property and says, oh, and, and also talks about her as if she's some kind of flirt. And in the end, he, he implied that he gave the command to kill her. At least that's some interpretations of it. But basically, in The Last Duchess, it shows how women had so little rights and that being, if you have a domineering husband, it can kill the spirit of that woman. And that happens in many stories, such as the story of an hour, the yellow, the yellow uh, wallpaper, and also um, in trifles as well. That's in that's in week seven, uh, and um, the last duchess. So that's a common theme. And so, uh, and in a poison tree, um, here he talks about Robert Blake talks about how hate can be like a poison that poisons the soul and and, and kills you. Basically, that's the life lesson. So just like just like st literature and stories. Poetry can also teach life lessons. And I love the way that 
he writes the poem in such a lyrical way about how, how hatred kills. And so that's, that's uh, uh, by Robert Blake, William Blake, excuse me, not Robert Blake, William Blake. And each poet uses the power of words to move the reader. And so, as I already mentioned, I too am America, okay, Harlem. Oh, and Harlem has, uh, what is it like to have your dream deferred? In other words, what is it like when you have to give up your dreams and your dream just is like a raisin that dries up in the sun? Hence the, and, and later somebody wrote a play, A Raisin in the Sun, about fulfilling their dreams. But basically, the, the main theme of Langston Hughes is the difficulty um, that African Americans had for equal rights and feeling like they were human and not being treated as subhuman by European Americans. And so, uh, and Langston Hughes, that was, a lot, that was the theme or the main idea or the core meaning in a lot of Langston Hughes's poetry. And uh, I also like the poem by Rina Espayot. I hope I said that right. And in her poem, Bilingual Bilang, oh, that's French. Uh, I, always, I always say everything in French. But here she talks about how in the outside world she would speak English, and then when she comes home she would speak Spanish. And it's like two different worlds, as if her heart has to be split in two. And then how her father is so proud of her being a writer, even though he doesn't understand English and doesn't understand all the content that she writes in her books. So the poetry talks about the dichotomy of being bilingual, Spanish and English. And for me, I related to that because of the, of the dichotomy I felt. See, this is an example of bringing your life experiences into what you read. And in my case, and in the case of a friend of mine, my grandparents could not speak English. And so when we were at home, we would speak Chinese. Because if, you wanted, if I wanted to include my grandparents into the conversation, I had to speak Chinese all the time. Then when I went to school or went to work outside of home, I would speak English. So it was like I, I, I lived in two different worlds. I'd go home and it's all Chinese, and then I go outside of home and it's all English. And when I was a kid, that's where I learned all my you know, bad words was on the playground or from friends, American friends, not from my parents. A lot of, a lot of kids would hear their parents say bad words and then repeat that. Okay, that's how a lot of, um, but for me, uh, I don't even remember my parents cursing in Chinese, come to think of it. They were very careful in how they spoke around us. So growing up, I remember I never heard my father curse or say any bad words. And so I grew up not even knowing any bad words in Chinese or in English until I hung out with peers, like Chinese people outside of, well, like in school and stuff. But basically, that poem, Bilang, or bilingual, really rang true for me because I remember having to go to the grocery store and having to translate to, for my grandmother and, or if I took my grandmother to the doctor, I had to translate into Chinese and English into Chinese what the doctor said. So if the doctor said to my grandmother, you have arthritis, you have to take two pills a day and come back in two weeks so I can see you know, your progress. Oh, and then I had to translate that into, um, into, English, into Chinese. Of course we did go see Chinese doctors, but when my grandmother got really, really sick, and her sickness went beyond what the local Chinese doctors could do, then they had to send my grandmother to a Anglo uh, hospital that only spoke mainly English, although they did have some translators, but Chinese has so many dialects, and that my grandmother spoke a dialect that their translator just you know, didn't do. So there I was to translate for her. So that's what happens when you are old and in another country that so that's why that poem really rang true for me. It was like I, I had my heart split in two. And I remember I wished, when I graduated from college, and my grandmother did not understand anything that was going, around, going on around her. Um, and, I, and when I made my speech, I made part of my speech in Chinese, so that she could at least participate in that. 
you know, because she was, it's like an alien world when you don't understand what's going on, like what people are saying around you. So, um, oh yeah, and also there's a um, website, not a website, very funny tape at the very end of your lesson I thought was really funny, where they say, can computers write poetry? I don't know, but there's a website called Bot or Not, which they try to test you. Can you tell if this poem was written by a computer or if this poem was written by a person? And they say that 65% of people can't tell the difference if the computer wrote the poem or if the uh, poem, a regular person, live person, wrote the poem. So it's very so you could check that out. I found that out on the on, in the classroom page. So that's really funny. It was a TED talk. So B O T or not, bot or not. In other words, did a robot write it or not? So I hope that this week um, my um, talk about poetry enlightened you about poetry uh, and gave you more inspiration to read poetry. So if you want a more complete uh, rundown on the collection, oh, and so I um, read aloud a lot of the poems that you can select for your assignment. When you do your poetry analysis, the school is going to give you a list of poems. and You have to choose from those poems to write your paper. You cannot write your paper about a poem that we talked about in the forums. It's got to be a poem you got to analyze that's from not that we did not go over. And also, you have to use a different poem because in week five and week six, we're going to have several assignments where you're going to be writing about poetry analysis. You have to use a different poem for each assignment. Do not use the same poem over and over again. So you got to use, otherwise you're going to end up with a high plagiarism score. And if you get a high plagiarism score, then I have to report you to the school. So that's why for each assignment, in, in all of your classes, you always have to have something new. You always got to write a new paper on a new topic. You can't reuse the same poem or reuse the same paper. So that's why I want to make sure that nobody gets in trouble with plagiarism, and that's why you would choose a different poem from the list. Okay, so let's say you, you used Langston Hughes for analysis one, then number two, you could use Shakespeare's sonnet, and then number three, you could write about, um, yeah, I can't remember the people's names. It, uh, Dorothy Park. Well, anyway, they have a whole list, okay? And what I did was I created a video where I'm reading every, all the different poems. So you could choose from one of those poems uh, to write your analysis. Now, if you choose to include, uh, and you don't have to do research to do your analysis. Uh, you don't have to go look up spark notes. You can if you want to, but if you do use some spark notes, you need to cite the source. Don't just write spark notes in saying it that's your own, because then Turnitin is going to recognize that as plagiarism and you get in trouble. So that's why you have to always cite your sources and use APA for everything that you write. Uh, so this ends uh, this week's uh, version of next week. Uh, in week six, I'm gonna, we're, we're going to continue our um, foray into poetry and we're going to talk more about how poems are intrinsically related to music and we're going to talk more about the musical aspects of poetry. What is it about poetry that can make you dance, for instance? And how is it, that, why, how and why is it that poetry is linked to um, music and how have writers, what, what poetic elements have poets used to render their poems more musical and the common elements between music and poetry. So uh, that's going to be something for you to look forward to next week uh, and so I hope to see you all next week and if you have any questions you can always email me. And don't forget if you want a complete anthology of poems, American poems, you should go check out the Norton Anthology of Poetry. So if you have any questions, you can feel free to email me.